Good evening, and welcome to the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School of Government. My name is Lois Romano, and I have had the privilege of being a resident fellow here this semester. The IOP was established in 1966 with the mission of inspiring young people like yourselves to enter careers in government, public service, and to, and to also serve as a bridge between academia and practitioners. The John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum is Harvard's premier arena for political speech, discussion, and discourse, a perfect venue for our guests tonight. We are delighted to have with us Chris Matthews, host of MSNBC's Hardball and The Chris Matthews Show. Our speaker knows as much or more about politics and the democratic process than anyone in the business today. His NBC colleague, Brian Williams, refers to him affectionately as Rain Man for his grasp of every minute detail of campaigns as well as the big picture issues of our time. Provocative and ubiquitous, Chris has had an undeniable impact on this marathon presidential race, as evidenced by the campaigns and candidates who try to get on his show, as well as the campaigns and candidates who have tried to silence him. His unbridled enthusiasm for politics is such that he sometimes asks his guests a question, and then before they have had a chance to formulate their answer, he answers it for them. <laughs> the London Daily Telegraph this week, or I think last week, responding to its own readers, recently named him the second most influential political pundit in America. Chris came to journalism and punditry in mid-career. After 15 years working for two senators, uh, a president and a speaker of the house. He has authored five books. The first, Hardball, after which his show is named, is still used as a textbook in many colleges. He is also a Churchillian scholar, and I would venture to say he has read everything about or by Churchill. He is undeniably a, a lightning rod, a thought-provoking combination of opinion maker and aggressive journalist who has clashed with the powerful and given a voice to the underdog. What you don't see and what I can speak to is what drives Chris. I can tell you that he is motivated by his strong moral convictions, a deep respect for history, and an instinctive sense of right and wrong. If going forward you all watch his show with this perspective, I promise you will have an entirely different appreciation for his contribution to the discourse and process of the American political system. As always, our guest will speak for 20 minutes and then we will turn to you for questions. If you've been here before, you know that one of the important elements of the forum is that all our guests have to agree to answer questions. So with that, please welcome Chris Matthews. Lois is uh, one of the great reporters for the Washington Post. Thank you. You know, uh, I'm here to make uh, something of a confession, although I have no moral shame. Uh, the television is limited in the way it can tell the political story of our time. Cable is limited because we look for an audience, and the audience is driven day to day by the story of the day. And so I, in putting together my thoughts tonight, I thought about it being a three-ring circus. In the old Barnum and Bailey sense, three rings, but the way that we cover it, we only cover the ring of fire, the one where there's real action right now. And oftentimes, the other rings get blinded from our sight. We can only see the ring where Jeremiah Wright is a figure in the Barack story. That ring becomes the only ring. And behind it is somewhere Hillary Clinton and her problems with candor, which will become bigger if she beats him in the primaries. And that will become the only ring then sometime in the general election if she's the nominee. Then we'll only be talking about that. And if John McCain uh, continues, he obviously will, as the Republican nominee, we'll get to him and his problems with the, Viet with the Vietnam War. Well, what's his problem with his idea of a continuing Vietnam War, which is Iraq? He's still fighting the old war. And so we'll get to those stories, but television can only seem to tell one really good hot story at a time. So when you turn it on, you're not gonna get the whole story. You gotta read that, and you gotta keep up and force yourself to keep up in all the rings and watch all the action, even though television can generally focus on one of the rings. That's the confession up front. This is going to be something, this election. I fear sometimes that it's going to be like 1968, that started with all, all the idealism and excitement of McCarthy and Kennedy and ended up with something very different, very, something very mundane. 
because of tragedy. I'm not so fearful of tragedy as I am of it just turning into something that it was not, something boring. I do worry about that. I want to talk for a few minutes. I only have about 15 or 17 minutes now to talk about the box this campaign came in, which I find more interesting than the, than the campaign at times. The country we live in and why the word change ignites so much passion. The word change, why it grabs people, why it's a, so seductive a word. It's not just an old word of the left. I mean, I spent a lot of my life with people of the old left or the new left, the new democratic coalition, the, the November doesn't count crowd, you know? And they all talked about change as if that was enough. Just say change. And Gene McCarthy used to say, an issues candidate is someone who said the word issues a lot. <laughs> I'm speaking to the issues, I'm running on the issues, that made you an issues candidate. But there really are some fundamental things that work in this year's campaign. First of all, I think it is one of the potentially one of the great change elections. There have been two of them, 32 and 80. You don't have to like either one of them to recognize that they were abrupt and different from what had come before. We've had smaller, of course, the Great Depression led to one after Republicans had ruled since the Civil War with only the exception of Cleveland and, and, uh, and, and Wilson. Basically, uh, that, that whole thing ended with the Great Depression and the failure of American capitalism in 32. In 1980, of course, double-digit inflation, double-digit uh, interest rates, and a hostage crisis. And I was a speechwriter of the president. I know the full excitement of the, the requirement for change. When people went to vote in 1980, they flushed the toilet. They went like this. They voted straight Republican. They wanted so much change. They wanted out of what they had. Smaller change elections. 1952, when Eisenhower ran, who had received the Nazi surrender, in fact, David, his grandson, once said, having received the Nazi surrender, even being president wasn't so big a deal. And he had done that. And he came in with a very simple camp, uh, promise. I'll go to Korea. And he did, and we had an armistice in six months. You know, that was a wartime leader who came to end a war. That was his mission. And he had a good first term. In 1960, another election that wasn't so dramatic as the 32 and 80 election was Kennedy's election a narrow election. I think it would have been perhaps a greater election had he been a, a Protestant, but it was still a, a significant election. That's because we sensed that Ike was losing a few steps by 1960. We had the U2 with Gary Powers. We had Cuba. We had, uh, most importantly, Sputnik. It made a sense that we were losing the Cold War. And right or wrongly, that moved the American people to get the country moving again with Kennedy, electing our youngest president. Smaller changes still, 1968. That was a hard election to vote. And I voted for Humphrey. I was in the Peace Corps training at the time. I voted for Humphrey because I thought, well, he was good on civil rights, and he was. And he had a good running mate, Muskie. But I thought Nixon would get us out of the war. I was wrong. I thought I was voting against the guy. that I thought Nixon would just cut and run and say, it's a goddamn Democrat war. We're getting out of here. I thought he'd be ruthless. He didn't. He stayed with it. Uh, we got out in the worst way. 92, the recession killed George Bush's presidency. Not a big deal, but Ross Perot cut his heart out with 19%, and Bill Clinton came in with 43%. Uh, the country would not stand for a recession. And I don't think they will this time either. And 2000, another relatively s small in its significance election, the election of George W. Bush. It was a combination of election, electoral process, Supreme Court intervention. We know the story. Personality played a role. Monica played a role. I think Al Gore felt that after Monica, he was sort of, well, Bill Clinton's bathtub ring. He was blamed for having done nothing. But he was blamed. What I do find when I look back over these recent presidential elections is that extraordinary times create extraordinary decisions. And the people who win would never have won otherwise. And that's how you have to look at this election in phenomenal terms. Don't look at it like previous elections, like an African-American, forget it, ain't gonna happen. Don't think of it that way. Because back in 32, a dilettante with a third-class mind was able to be elected president because everybody said, we need to change. We gotta try something new. We gotta try this guy Roosevelt. Gotta try him. In 80, we got to try this Hollywood actor who was then doing Death Valley Days. We got to try something. This thing ain't working. Americans generally don't say this is as good as it gets. The great thing about our country is we never say better this way. We almost always say this ain't as good as it gets. We got to try something better. And when we stop judging things like that, we're finished. We're not European. We don't just accept the way things are. We're not a stationary state. We always try something new. We do. 
I'm not knocking the Europeans. They've got it figured out their way. But we're still a dynamic, somewhat charismatic country that wants inspiring leaders, you know. <laughs> we don't want bureaucrats, technocrats. Extraordinary times call for extraordinary leaders. And right now, we have all the ingredients, since we don't have military coups in this country, for major change. We've got a backlog of issues that seems to grow every year and never gets shorter because nothing has been solved since the passage. I believe Congress hasn't done anything since the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 65. Ever since then, we've just diddled around. Uh, <laughs> fiscal craziness, we now have deficits that don't even keep count anymore. We just borrow from the Chinese. We don't even think about it. Nobody talks about it. Republicans gave up on fiscal responsibility. Democrats were just glad they never brought it up again because nobody brings it up anymore. Nobody even asks, what's the deficit? Nobody knows what it is. I don't know what it is anymore. It's somewhere around three, I guess. It's always about three. Social security is always going to be a problem because people my age are retiring and people your age are going to have to carry the load and there's not <clears throat> enough of you to carry us. Um, the health care, we've been promised health care in this country since Harry Truman. Nothing's happened. Energy dependence grows every year. It's a buck twenty a barrel tonight and it keeps going up. Uh, climate change, that's brand new. That's just on the list now. We just put it on the list. Every time something new comes along, we put it on the old list. The old list gets longer. It's like a partridge in a pear tree at Christmas time. Just add one more stanza. It grows and grows. Nothing gets done. And the 51 senators blame it on the 49 senators. The 49 senators blame it on the 51 senators. If I only had 60 votes, look what I could do. Everybody's got an excuse. And every time the voter goes into the booth, they split the parties between each other. And then they, they say, what, how clever I was. I divided Congress. I divided the power. I let presidents alternate every eight years. I'm so sophisticated. It ends up we have no government. We have no majority party. Nothing gets done. We're so smart. We don't trust anybody, nor should we. Anyway, <laughs> right now, the, the mood of change, we, we get this Wall Street Journal poll and the NBC poll. I've never seen numbers like that. 15% of the American people, one in six, say we're going in the right direction. Who are they? Stand up. <laughs> one in six, you're here. 73% three quarters say wrong direction. These numbers, by the way, are brand new. And they're the great indicator of how the next election is going to go. Because if we like the direction, we elect the, re-elect the incumbents in our very binary system. The Bush approval level is now 27. That is, that's below Nixon. Uh, <laughs> elections, uh, elections correct problems. Again, there is a logic to American democracy. We have not missed an election since 1788. We are good at it. We hold elections. We don't have coups. We don't have new republics like the French. We've got the same one we started with. We never miss. It's always in November. It always works. We always have the function of a democracy. And the other thing we have to do is we generally fix a problem with an election. That's all we got. All we really have is that binary system, yes or no. Ins, ends, stay in, outs come in, ins go out, whatever. That's all we can do. It's binary. It's not even yes or no. It's push a button, yes or no. 32, we had the Great Depression. The country changed dramatically in March of 33 from Hoover's country to FDR's country, a totally different country in one day. From a country of stiff righteousness to a country of innovation and risk and a little bit of socialism, a very little bit of it. Uh, in 1952, we went from Harry Truman and the Pentagrass crowd from Kansas City and the crowd he had around him and they weren't getting anywhere in Korea and we were stuck in Korea at the 38th parallel, losing guys like you wouldn't believe. And we brought in the commander in chief from Europe who had won the war in Europe and we were, we were out of that war in six months. Very dramatic decision. 1960, we had an old president, we brought in a new president, a young president. We got the country moving again. We had the Peace Corps, Alliance for Progress, everything came in. A totally different atmosphere in Washington. By the way, those who were there at the time, some of you here, or very few of you here, I gotta tell you, people remember it as a total change from Eisenhower to Kennedy because of an election. We have power. Every two years, the power of America goes back to the voters and they send it back to Washington, totally new if they want to. Totally new. Elections are dynamite. In 1980, same thing, Reagan came in. I, God, I was, what did I do that day? I was a speechwriter. Oh, I left the, uh, the, uh, the White House at quarter to 12 that day. I thought, my, I thought tissue reject rejection would set in if I stayed into the, I saw them putting up the pictures of Reagan, you know, and all the cowboy pictures went up around noon. <laughs> I thought it was time to go. One guy, uh, one guy stayed, Gordon Stewart, one of the other speechwriters, stayed for lunch. How did he do it, you know? They're here, get out, you know? <laughs> I had my Rolodex and my books. I said, I'm walking down the street here. I'm out of here. Uh, in 2000, uh, Clinton went out and uh, Bush came in. 
Different country, the president goes to bed with his wife at 9.30 every night. Wow. Uh, we got what we wanted. That's what we wanted. We wanted to clean up the Monica mess. We cleaned that mess up and got a few other problems. But uh, So 2012, what is the problem? What is the solution? If we get that into our heads, we're real scholars of the situation. What is the problem? What is the deficiency in our, our leadership? What is the problem that historians will look back and say, we solved in 1912? 1912, 2012, that we solved it, that we got to the big central lacking, just like there was a lacking with Hoover in activity. There's a problem of, of, of uh, Truman being stuck in Korea. There's a problem of Ike losing some steps in the Cold War. There's a problem of Carter's weakness in the face of double-digit everything. What is the big problem we're going to solve now in this election? Let me suggest three things, OK? And this is always where I begin to get into trouble. Uh, first of all, the mindset. I like the word the way Barack Obama refers to the mindset that got us into Iraq. It's not just the technical decision to go to this country or that country, invade that country. It's the mindset of American power that's unlimited and we can do what we want to do, whether it's create democracy overseas, nation build, interrupt the geopolitics of a region by intervention, by preventive action or preemptive. It's really more prevention. Uh, Barack's message, I want to talk about that in a minute, and I want to talk what a president ought to know. How's that for a dramatic statement? What a president ought to know. The mindset. Every time somebody tries to defend this war policy by defending soldiers, they are being dishonest. Because the soldier has to do his or her duty. And that makes it all the more important for the policymakers to take the responsibility for the policy. Not the soldier, not General Petraeus. Every time a policymaker stands behind a soldier and says, don't you like the soldiers? No, that's not the issue. When soldiers are so good as we have with a volunteer army right now, with not draftees raising hell, but volunteer soldiers, professional soldiers, who do what they're told to do, that makes it all the more important if they're willing to make their sacrifice that they had by 4,000 guys and women and 30,000 uh, wounded. The fact that they're willing to take orders and do the job of a modern army makes it all the more important that the policymakers take responsibility for their decisions and their mistakes, and they correct them, and they're honest about them, and they don't blame the policy on General Petraeus. It's not his policy. It's not Ryan Crocker's policy. It's President Bush's policy that he, of his own volition, as he said, I'm the decider. Remember that? He decided, and now he lays it on Petraeus. Is it Petraeus decided? This is very important that we get this straight. Harry Truman had to fire Doug MacArthur because Doug MacArthur thought he was the boss and Truman had to remind us of our Constitution. Civilians make the call, okay? And I think it's very important to understand that the mindset that took us into Iraq must be examined in this election if the voters are gonna be thoughtful about it. They have to understand that mindset. We can talk about that for hours. There's so many books on it. But the mentality that led us into the sense that we could control the destiny of a country like Iraq, was a decision made by one president. And I think it has to be reconsidered. I have to say one thing about the Kennedy brothers being here, because it does come to mind. Back a number of years ago, when I was running for the San Francisco Examiner, I wrote a, a magazine cover piece for Sunday about Bobby Kennedy. And I just think that something's really important going on right now in terms of the spiritual nature of this campaign. And I'm not telling anybody how to vote. I do tell people how I feel about people in this election. I share a total reporting a portfolio. I tell you how I feel completely. I don't just say what I heard. I tell you how I react to it. But I don't tell anybody how to vote or how to make a decision. But Robert Kennedy in Indianapolis, the night that, Robert, that uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated, I had to be at North Carolina Chapel Hill in grad school studying economics, and I was down in, the, uh, down in the stacks, and somebody came by and told me that Martin Luther King had been killed. Robert Kennedy, at about that time, was driving into the, the ghetto in Indianapolis, and he was warned by the Secret Service, don't go in. I mean, his brother had been killed. Don't go in. It's too dangerous. And here's this white guy going into a black neighborhood, which has a reputation for being tough, I suppose, and the attitudes were obviously precarious at that point. He had to go to that crowd and tell them that Martin Luther King had been assassinated. There was no 24-7 news coverage in those days. There was no cell phones, no cable, no internet, nothing. People were told by a politician, guess what, your hero's dead and I'm here to tell you. Now that's a different kind of courage and a different kind of brotherhood than we'd seen from politicians up to that time in America. A white guy talking as a brother to black people. That was new. His brother was a little colder about it, 
Bobby was real about it. Now, this time in this election, we have a black candidate running who I think is trying to do the same thing from the other direction, which makes it very important spiritually to this country, what's going on now. Vote any way you want, but that's something that's unique to this country, what I've heard from this guy in these speeches. It's about brotherhood across the racial, what I call the San Andreas fault of American life, which at any moment can be an earthquake. And it could be again in this election because of this Jeremiah Wright thing that's going on. So I think that's something very big in this election. The mindset of the current administration, the spiritual contribution of Barack Obama in this campaign, I think are, well, they're essential to understanding this year's election. There's no way to look at the last six months without getting into that and how that's being played with right now. What else? I think the third thing is the education of a president. I think at the time when we elected, and I voted for Bush the first time, I now accept the fact that I am not without sin. <laughs> I thought he had common sense. I thought he was a new, fresh breath of fresh air. I thought he wasn't held back by old sort of liberal ideas that would have held him back or whatever. I'm not sure what into my head. I was probably just mad at Clinton over, over Monica. I can't explain it at this time. Or Gore's strange campaign of fear and, uh, and fright. I thought the campaign was about fear and fright, and I didn't think it was a positive campaign at all, and I think it should have been. But whatever happened, we elected a president who has a manifest lack of curiosity. Now, I think the next president, I think we've learned the lesson is we want a president who has, who, who has been a student of the world and is a student of the world. I think they're both important in this election. To pick a president of the three that we have running right now, McCain, Hillary, or Barack, who seems to be a student of the world, and has been a student of the world in the past, has manifested curiosity about the world. I think we really need presidents like that from now on, because we live in the world. And I think people say, uh, you want a president you want to have a, share a beer with, how about a president you want to share a planet with? I think it's a big question picking a president now. It can't be a casual post-Cold War presidency. We thought after winning the Cold War, or not losing it rather, that it wasn't that important. Maybe we could get through a sort of a casual president. I think people didn't understand the stakes. And I'm not talking 9-11. I'm talking about the bigger stakes the world in right now. A president that understands that we've sort of incurred the Chinese curse. We wanted the world to go capitalist. Guess what it has? We fought the Cold War to end uh, communism. Well, we got capitalism. We got the BRIC countries coming at us, and we're borrowing from the Chinese to pay for a war in the Mideast. And we've got the BRIC countries, starting with Brazil and Russia and India and China, with the, the stock markets booming, and you have the, the Marrakesh snake charmers don't take the dollar anymore. They only want the euro, the snake charmers. I'm not sure that's a leading indicator, but it is a cause for concern. <laughs> and the cab drivers in Havana won't take the dollar anymore. They only want the euro. And so uh, there are things happening in the world that the next president, whether it's Hillary or it's Barack or it's uh, John McCain, have better damn well come quickly to master, and maybe not from day one, as Senator Clinton likes to say, but damn fast. And they can't be quick students. They have to have been used to reading the newspaper and understanding complicated issues. Maybe have read the Financial Times for five or 10 years to start with, at least know the world. So we have these three realities coming at us with this demand for change, this backup backlog of what we want to deal with in this country. And everybody in this room has two or three issues they want us to address in this country. And all this concern about the, uh, the mindset that led us into Iraq and the mindset that may lead us into Iran, which sounds like the same mindset. And then you have the spiritual awakening that Barack has begun in this campaign. And I'm not sure where it should lead to. I'm not saying he's going to be the next president or that he should be. But there's some questions being raised about America at home that nobody thought would be raised in this election. We haven't had race raised as an issue. I can't remember how long it's been to just openly look at it and look at the three centuries of suppression and repression that led, well, we have a, maybe, maybe a century of not suppression. I'm not sure of that yet. But we have a history of this problem. And this guy's offering a, a different approach. A brotherhood, I think, is his approach. And without grief, without grievance, without anger, a different approach. And it's new. And it may not come again for a while. We have a, a president, of Senator Clinton, who's offering her approach, which she offers uh, in her own very gutsy way. She's run a very gutsy campaign. She brilliantly exploited his mistake in Pennsylvania, his bitter remark. 
to become the girl from Scranton. Brilliant. I mean, most people now think Hillary got a GED from somewhere in Scranton. <laughs> never heard of Wellesley or Yale Law or any of that stuff. She's local. She's brilliant. No, I'm telling you, it's, I, I say it, and Bubba's down there working the little towns, and he's now on the dinner circuit, the dinner theater circuit down there in North Carolina. He's going around the small towns, and they are the best. They are a roadshow company that as long as we live, I think we'll see them on the road. So, but there are important things in this election. I think it's going to be a, either a change election or one people will wonder why it wasn't. And uh, McCain is learning quickly how to triangulate, how to avoid being a bushy. And so we've got three candidates of pretty high caliber running right now, and we're going to see whether the American people use this election to fix our problems or simply put them off and allow ourselves to be distracted by little stuff. Thank you. Okay, we'll take your questions now. We have four microphones. We have one here, one here, one up there, and one uh, over here, okay? And we have a couple of rules. Please identify yourself. Um, keep your questions short. One question, no speeches. And we like questions that actually um, end in a question mark. So uh, I'm gonna start here and then go around this way and come this way, sir. Hi, Chris. I love your talk. Uh, my name is King or Malik. Yeah. Um, you afraid of me? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> as I like long that as you don't have man. thrills going up your, up your leg. <laughs> you know, that's funny, too. You want to um, match wits? What's that? You want to match wits? <laughs> um, <laughs> you. Uh, it, it almost sounded like you were saying that we need a U.S. president who is less American, the way we understand the word American to mean uh, to most, most Americans. And given that, you know, in the, in the fall, um, you know, the, five, the right, more right-wing 527s are probably going to attack Barack, assuming he's the nominee, yeah. uh, on patriotism, on his not being American enough in a way, which we sort of got a preview to in yeah, the first I know what you mean. McCain commercial. Um, do you think that the Obama campaign should try to position being the way he is an American, his unique story, as being the new definition of what an American should be? I think that's what he might try to do. I'm not sure he might try a more traditional approach and start doing some of the iconic iconoclastic, or not iconoclastic, iconic things like wearing the pin and things like that. But here's what I think you're getting at. You know, I was lucky to be in the Peace Corps in Africa. And the great thing about being in the Peace Corps, the 200,000 people that have been in the Peace Corps, we owe so much to this country because of what we were able to do. What you pick up on very quickly is other countries' nationalism, what we call our patriotism. It's the same thing. It's the sensitivity that other countries feel towards their homeland. And they feel it so deeply. The smaller the country, by the way, maybe the more sensitive they are. And they really do resent intervention. And uh, I think that's a knowledge of the world that takes a certain perspective that you don't get at school. You know, you can learn certain things at school. But I think that, that appreciation of the world is out there. And when you're out there and look back home, and by the way, when you come home, you just love to come home. I mean, I, do, I couldn't wait to see American coins in my hand and dollars. I said, I'm home, this is great. Everybody's got an American accent. I just love being home after two years over there. But while you're over there, you get this wonderful sense of connecting with another part of the world. You know, we, our, nas our nationalism, our patriotism is so deep, I'm not worried about it rubbing off. But I think we should rub on a little understanding of other countries' feelings. And I think if that's what you mean, that's what I hope he brings if he comes in. Because I think that sense of growing up in Indonesia, in that environment, and having an African father, and being able to see us as we are, I think he can step outside and look in at us. And if that rubs people as a little foreign, I think they're making a big mistake. I think our mistakes in recent history has been a failure to understand the world around us. And we, although I do believe in American exceptionalism in a positive sense, I don't think we're uh, apart from the world. Thank you. He's gonna have to, and he's gonna have to do it in a traditional enough way to get elected. But I like the part of it that's not traditional, like you do. That's the part I like. 
You know, I once said he has a third world aspect, and somebody said, that's a knock. I said, not for me, it ain't. It's a plus. I think we have a, have a little bit of that revolutionary sense ourselves that we used to have. I love it. Thank you. I think presidents who've been in the Peace Corps would be great. I mean, I, not that it's the most important thing, but in terms of dealing with the world, it's good to know the world a little. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Chris, thank you for coming. My name's Aaron Michael. I'm a joint degree here and over at HBS. I want to, you started by talking about how the media can only focus on one story That's at a time. Do. How do you How do you think that the media chooses that one story? And generally speaking, it's what people specific, are watching. Well, it's called uh, the running story. I mean, I'll defend it, but I, I'm, not, I'm not actually going to defend it. I'll just defend the reason it's done. You know, Hemingway, when he used to, if you read, uh, where did, where did I read this, pick this up in one of his books? Uh, what's the easy one? Movable Feast. It's just a bunch of stories. I love easy stories. And uh, he talked about he loved French cafes because you could always sit around and have a coffee or a drink or something and, then, and get a pile of newspapers because there's always a good running mystery story or murder story in the Paris newspapers. It's a running story. So it was Monica, it was something else. You get into a running story. People pick up on a story, and then they watch it every night. It's like a serial from Saturday morning in the old days. That's the way people watch. They don't every night turn on and say, what's new? They want to know what's a little old that they can catch up with. So that's the way people watch things. They watch them in serial fashion. That's why we stay with the one story. It's just human nature. If you don't mind me finishing the, that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wanted you to comment specifically on uh, Jeremiah Wright versus Reverend Hagee. Am I pronouncing his name correctly? Hagee, yeah. Uh, because if you, I, I look at the left-wing blogs from time to time and the right-wing blogs. The left-wing blogs keep on hammering on this guy, but you never actually see him, or a, a, any information about him when you know I, I look at your show or any of the other shows on, on the various cable news channels. Well, we had a but big meeting. We had a meeting about story. Hagee this morning with the producers, and uh, we're going to do it. We didn't do it today. We had the, the primary tomorrow, but uh, Frank Rich made that point on Sunday in the New York Times. And uh, you know, you can argue whether what's more relevant, the ministry you attend, the church you attend for 20 years, or a guy that endorsed you. You know, but Hagee's an anti-Catholic. What do you call it, the great whore or something? I mean, you know, not a great person probably, but... Uh, <laughs> Depending on your point of view, but um, I agree. We got to find a way to get to that story too. But as I said, it's the problem of the three rings, and the one that's on the one that's on fire, the one in front of you, seems tends to block tends to block out the other two while that's going on. Thank but you. I agree with you. We should do it. But you know, would people watch it? Who's Hagee? Who's this guy? It takes a while to sort of get people to know who the guy. Oh yeah, that guy. I'm mad at him too. And, <laughs> you know, you know, Hi, Chris. Uh, my name is Shankar Ramaswamy. I'm a freshman at the college. And my question is, um, how do you respond to accusations that MSNBC has officially supported Obama? Well, it's not official. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think Joe Scarborough has, and I don't think Tucker Carlson did. And, Joe, and, and, Ke and, and uh, Keith does his thing. Uh, he does his thing. It's, it's something, and it's, it's very successful. Uh, I do my thing. Uh, I don't think that's true. I think, uh, I, I think my sense is that everybody who lives in New York is for Hillary. The people I work with, all my bosses seem to be for Hillary. I, I just sense it. They don't actually say it, but there's no sense from the top, I can tell you, that it's pro-Obama by any means. That's not what I get, and it was basically pro-war during the war the bosses were. And I, I, I was up against that. And if there's anybody telling me push Obama, I haven't heard it yet. And by the way, they're so fickle. But there is, seems to be a New York thing about Hillary. Just the people from it, it's like the Yankees or the Mets. It's their thing, you know. It's Hillary, you know, and I feel it. And I always, I find it it's hard to figure sometimes. Um, I but, guess I, the, but I don't know who you're, t I know who you're talking about. Well, the, the only reason I ask is because um, when watching MSNBC, I've heard Obama... Um, campaigners actually tell the viewer, just watch MSNBC for further information about Obama. Where do you see that? That's cool. I, I've seen it, on, <laughs> seen it on the news network. I'll so. take it. I accept the good. Chris, my name is Don Kurth. I'm a mid-career student from Rancho Cucamonga, California. Uh, thanks for coming up here, by the way. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the economy. You touched on it a couple of times, the price of oil, the national debt. The, uh, it seems like we're skidding into a recession, or we're there already. 
How are we going to get out of this from your point well, of view? Well, I think we're in a recession. I think we have a business cycle. And, and that's the normal uh, capitalist societies have cycles. And uh, we're in sort of a downward mode now. Bernanke seems to be fighting it. I always wonder, he's fighting it awful hard, isn't he? Like maybe keep it off till after November, you know? Um, I'm sure George Bush Sr. would have liked uh, Alan Greenspan to have done that service for him back in 92, because that re recovery kicked in in the fourth quarter. Uh, Clinton, by the way, the luckiest man in the world. We know that, but you know, he had the, his recovery came in the fourth quarter and it left him just as Al Gore was trying to get elected. Uh, um, you know, I don't know, I think the recession, you know, you, you, I, I've seen all the tools, monetary policy, fiscal policy, they're all slow to act. They modify it, but you know, they, I just, I don't, I don't want to get uh, malfusion about it or something, but I think these, reci these, uh, these cycles come. And uh, you know, you have oversupply, you got to get demand cooked up again. And uh, I worry about the serial trend, not so much the cycle. I worry about the loss of wealth through oil. I worry about 120 barrels a barrel as a leakage from our economy that just keeps growing, and there's no kickback. I guess you could say petrodollars at some point. They're going to buy stuff over here and invest, but you know, I do worry about that. It's not like a tax that at least when somebody taxes you, they spend the money somewhere. Whatever it's done, it's spent somewhere, whereas petro money just goes away. I worry about China being able to buy all the resources of the world, including ours, our natural just. Buy them all, like in Syriana, just, well, we got a better deal for you. Uh, I worry, that's what I worry about, the cereal, the trend. The cycle, we've been there. I worry about a trending uh, decline in our wealth because we're buying stuff every day. Just get up Saturday morning in Washington, where I live, in Chevy Chase, and look out to Connecticut Avenue, and the traffic is unrelenting. People get up and get in their cars and don't even know where they're going. They just get up and go. It's Saturday morning, there's no work today, but everybody's in a car going to the mall or some. I don't know where they're going, the outlets. I don't know where they're going. They're going to, they're going to Starbucks. They're going somewhere in that car. Everybody's in the car, and all this gas is being used up, and it's not. We're spending a quarter of the world's oil, and we don't make it here anymore. So uh, that's what I worry about. Research, it's, it's almost a bullionist theory. I worry about those countries aren't going to make it in the long run, the Arab countries with oil, because in the end, it will ruin their economies, because you'll just not make anything. You'll just use the petrodollars. My wife just got back from skiing in Dubai. That puts it in total perspective. <laughs> skiing in Dubai. They have so, anything you, it's like Phileas Fogg in, in around the world in any days. Anything you can buy, they buy. And I don't think that's a healthy, uh, diverse economy yet, but uh, I do worry about that. Hi, Mr. Matthews. Thanks so much for being with us today. Um, my name is Becca. I'm a senior at Harvard College. And uh, your book, Life is a Campaign, was actually assigned for a course I was in this semester, um, Politics with Congress with Professor King. Shout out to my Gov 1300 people. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, we've taken over this forum. Um, that was good for me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the book, you know, was probably unfairly criticized by other jealous talk show hosts. Yeah, uh, I know. Little guys. <laughs> but, you know, whether for, yeah, for the advice being instrumental or whatever, but I think we can all agree that whether or not life is a campaign, a campaign is definitely a campaign. So my question for you is... No, no, is, I think when you're coming out of school, especially <laughs> those of you coming out like seniors and, you, and, you, and you're going to hit the bricks, if you're going to grad school or professional school, that's very similar to what you've been doing. You study, you get ahead, you do well, you get good grades, move on to the next year. But most of life, the minute you get out of school, is, is, is particular things you have to do that you never had to do. And one of them I try to teach is asking. You have to ask for the deal. I got something to give you, give me my break, give me my chance, because I can deliver for you. That's the most important thing in the world, is being able to just walk up and say, not, you don't beg, you say, I got something for you, me. And you gotta believe in it, and you gotta do it. And that separates you from the couch potatoes and all the people with dreams, because nobody's coming to your house knocking on the door and say, I heard you had a dream. Can I help you with it? <laughs> nobody's ever coming to you with that dream. They're never coming to you. And most people keep thinking, well, I'll get the promotion next year. I got one last year. No, 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 no. Once you're out of school, you got to go ask. And I got all this out of Machiavelli, so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's not good. It's not bad. It's just you got to do it. Well, I appreciate that advice. I actually am thinking of uh, joining the Peace Corps next year. That's so. different. That's what I did. Yeah. <laughs> when you get out, start asking. Copying the best. Well, my question for you is, you know, a campaign surely is a campaign. And so if you could offer one or two pieces of advice from your book to one of the presidential candidates in this election, what would it be and why? Jeez. Who do I want to help? <laughs> um, that's a great question. 
I think that uh, Barack Obama represents what Br Ron Brownstein, uh, who now writes for the National for Atlantic Magazine, calls the um, idealistic wing of the Democratic Party. That's the party, that Bobby Kennedy, Gene McCarthy, Adlai Stevenson, Paul Sangas, you know, that party that I've always been attracted to. And then there's the other Democratic Party, which is the party of needs, older people, poor people that need spe specific things now. And they need hope now. And whether it's civil rights in their lives or it's social security checks or it's Medicare, or it's Medicaid for poor people, they need things, or child development, or they need um, better public education or child care. These are real things people need right now. I think Brock hasn't talked to those need people enough. I think he's talked to the college grads. I think he's talked to the hearts of African Americans like himself because he carries their dreams without saying a word. Not saying a word. But I think he has to talk to the other part of the Democratic Party that doesn't have dreams, they have needs. They, they, they have given up on dreaming right now. They just want the check. And he's gotta to talk to those people. Hillary does it masterfully. She ignores all the other stuff and goes right to the need people and talks to them about their basic needs today. And I think that he's gotta work that other side of the Democratic Party if he's gonna hold that party together. Because there are a lot of people out there, you know, they talk like this, they talk basic. You know, what is this guy gonna do? What's this guy all about? This guy with the African name, who is this guy? What's he gonna do? And he ought to do something like the SEIU commercial in Pennsylvania, which is he's taken on the oil companies and the special interest. I like the sound of that. Taken on the, the enemies of the Democratic working people. And also identifying and saying, I'm gonna give you your stuff. You know? He doesn't do either. He doesn't go after the bad guys from the Democratic point of view. And this isn't about dividing the country. This is going, taking on, and he laughs about his cousin, Dick Cheney. Stop laughing. It's not funny. If he's your cousin, that's your problem, but it's not funny. <laughs> and, and I think he ought to say something a little more severe at times about the people he's up against. So I think he can continue to be an idealist, but he's got to get the people with needs, and he's got to talk about the people that really bug Democratic voters, oil companies, Special interest, car, row, whatever, whatever, combination. He was, by the way, the number one pundit in the country. <laughs> I'm number two to Carl Rove. Gee whiz. <laughs> uh, you know, anyway. Anyway, that's what I think. That's the only guy I want to give advice to right now. Hillary doesn't need it. She's, she's doing swimmingly right now. Right now. Thank you. Up here. Hi, Mr. Matthews. Um, my name is Nafi Sayed. I'm a sophomore here at the college. And my question for you is, what do you think Barack Obama should do, or, or rather, what else do you think he should do to focus the media's attention on something other than the current uh, ring of fire right now, which is I don't know right. why, Miss. I don't know why he didn't, when Tim Russert was questioning him rather toughly yesterday for 20 minutes, why he didn't say, Tim, enough of that, let's move on to something else. I think at some point, the candidate themselves, or himself, herself, I think Hillary would have done it, because Hillary does that when you're pushing her on certain things. She why don't you ask me some real questions? I mean, she'll just say that. She stood up the other day, what she stand up with, uh, with George Stephanopoulos and just sort of directed the program. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you gotta take the grab your reins once in a while from the, uh, from the journalist. And uh, I think it's time for them to say, we've talked about this enough. I mean, it, there's nothing more to say right now. He's got this guy as his minister for 20 years. You can believe anything he'll say or not believe it, but there's nothing really to be argued about. There's no factual discussion left. It's just arguing. You know, we know he's had him as a minister. He didn't do anything about it until he ran for president. Now he's doing something about it. And that other guy's out there competing with him. And, but I don't think he can, I think he has to take the lead. And the one way he can do it is win in Indiana tomorrow. You wanna change the subject? Win. And maybe that's a circle argument, but I think if he can win two tomorrow, he could end this thing. And uh, you better get the uh, vote out in Gary. And I think he's, he's working on that. He's got to get the zealous vote out, the African-American vote. He's got to get the 200,000 registered college students out to vote. He's got to get them out to vote. And uh, that'll change the subject, beating us, beating the media. That's what I think. Hi, Chris. Thanks for coming. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me uh, why BBC and CNN both reported the collapse of World Trade 7 before it actually happened. And I'm also wondering... I I didn't know they did. I'm, I'm wondering if you'd like to... I said uh, I didn't know they did. Okay. Uh, well, I'm wondering if you'd like to uh, interview William Rodriguez because uh, he 
He was the uh, head janitor at uh, the World Trade Center. And no, he, I don't want to interview him. Why not? Because he, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Well, neither is he. Well, you are. <laughs> I am? Well, of course I, you are. Why I are we think, talking about this now? I think the uh, official story is a, a conspiracy theory, and I think you're helping cover it up. I'm part of the cover-up team. I, I stand guilty of, as charged. Yeah. Hi, Chris. My name is Gordon Robison. I'm a mid-career here. And by the way, I was in the CNN control room on 9-11. Uh, we did it after it happened. We reported it. Uh, <laughs> but as I've just indicated before coming to Harvard, I worked in cable news. I've worked for both uh, CNN and Fox. And I'd like to go back to something you said at the beginning about the, the three-ring circus and the media's herd mentality. The in a, it, it's not just the fact that the media focuses on one thing, but that everybody focuses on the same thing. Yeah, but I think and, and, is yeah. There, and is there a way well, you know. to break away from Well, I don't, have no, the kind of, I don't have the kind of pull at a network that you do. If someone like you says, if someone like you says, you know what, we're not doing that today, the okay. senior producers like me say, okay, hey, that's cool. We don't have to chase something else just because okay. the competition. We're in the middle it. of that right now with this Barack story. Let me tell you, I spent... Uh, three months pushing the investigation as to how this war got started with Iraq and the WMD case and the way that it was covered up by the people in the vice president's office and the people in the defense department. And I pushed that story and pushed that story and pushed that story until finally the criminality in the administration was exposed, okay? I get in trouble for saying the simple fact that this guy was caught with five felony charges of perjury and obstruction of justice, the chief of staff to the vice president, who I believe was doing the work of the vice president. He wasn't out robbing gas stations. This was something he was doing at work. And I raised that issue and pushed that issue for three months, and we took a lot of heat for it. Why do you keep, you know, Imus would say, why do you keep saying Scooter Libby? Because I know from having worked in the White House that all the paper flow goes to the Vice President's Chief of Staff, and in this case, all the intelligence was going to the Chief of Staff, and the Vice President spent six times going over to Langley to push the case for the war, and I did my enterprise on that. Okay, so I have gone out on my own, and I pushed this story, and it worked. It popped finally, and we got some piece of the truth out of it, which is the criminality. And still reporters said, what criminality is he talking about? It's very hard to lead the media into somewhere it doesn't want to go, you know? But you're right. But all I can tell you is you know what happens is if, the, if three different networks, Fox, CNN, and us, all sit down and pick up the New York Times or read the Wall Street Journal, whatever we read in that day, the Post, the Washington Post, I read four or five papers, you get some ideas, and all the producers call in with their ideas, we have our conference call at 9 in the morning. I'll bet you those conference calls are fairly similar among all the networks because they're all feeding off the print media. And maybe the blogs, sometimes, they're feeding off what's on the web. And they're digging it up, and they're basically coming to the same notion, this is something that people want to watch tonight, this is something we should put on its novel or it's watchable, you know? But thinking outside the box is hard. Yeah, no, it's, it's hard. And, and I've been on those conference calls, too. But what I'm talking about is three hours later, when you're standing in the control room and somebody looks up at the TV and something that another network has just started and says, why aren't we doing that? I've heard that, too. And suddenly, we're doing that. And then the next network's doing that. And we're all doing that. I agree. With you. I, yes. I don't know if I do that because I'm arrogant. But, uh, <laughs> but you're right. Normal people do that. <laughs> No, thank you. You're so right. All these criticisms are right. By the way, this is, this is all, there's no, you haven't heard anything here that's wacky except that guy up there. He was crazy. Uh, uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Jorge Otto from the medical school. I wanted to get into your political mind. Can sure. you explain to us from the beginning of you know, January what were the strategies from the, these three main candidates and from now on? What would be the next Well, the step? strategy of the Barack Obama campaign, which you never would have thought would have been so brilliant, was to go to those rural Republican states and dominate all the caucuses. I mean, own them. I mean, you can actually predict ahead now the ones that are left. You know, you get, was it Montana still out there? It's the, one of the Dakotas is out there. And, and, and Oregon, they're going to win them all. You know, they won Guam the other day. I mean, they're really out there organizing, you know? And uh, I think they did that really well. They didn't to do so well. The Clintons have been very good at what you might call the traditional politics of constituency. They've got the uh, Governor Rondell of Pennsylvania and Chris Doherty, the mayor of uh, Scranton, and Ed Pulaski, the mayor of uh, Allentown, and uh, I do know Pennsylvania, and uh, Mike Nutter of, of Philly. And, and uh, 
Anarada out in Pittsburgh. I mean, they went around and got each one of these guys behind him, and they ran a very organized establishment campaign. Hillary Clinton is very good at calling in the old shits. I mean, if you're dealing with Tommy Menino in Boston, for example, all those years of relationships with the Clintons, all those pilot programs, all those advantages that Bill, as president, has made sure Boston benefited from, you're going to come back and feel a sense of gratitude. That's just a fact. So established relationships are what the Clintons developed, really a kind of a, a almost a, a, a pioneering sense of organization on the part of uh, Barack. That's the, those are the two strategies. Are you going to run for the Senate seat in 20? This is a follow-up question. Yes. Uh, uh, going, I don't. Do you, can you read the future, sir? No. Neither can Are I. you going to run? I'm not running. Uh, let me just let me get my words right. <laughs> 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 I have made a commitment to covering politics, not engaging in it. You sound like a politician Thank right you. now. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, Jim Snyder, a fellow at the Shorenstein Center on Press Politics Hi. and Public Policy. Hi. Uh, so let's say there's the presidential elections ring and the, and the congressional elections ring. Yeah. Uh, when I watch uh, MS, M MSNBC and the other election shows uh, on election eve, it's almost all overwhelmingly on the presidential election, yeah. even though there are 435 uh, House seats up and a third of the Senate up in this uh, election. Um, when the founders created the Constitution, they thought the legislative branch should be more important than the presidential branch. You'd sort of never know it <laughs> reading the national newspapers and, and watching the uh -huh. national media. Even the local media seems to be far more obsessed with national politics than, say, uh, congressional politics. It's not that the American public is happy with Congress. The president has a low rating in the high 20s. Congress is even lower in the lower 20s in their approval right rating. Now. Is this a problem for our democracy that the media seems to be so focused on presidential elections as opposed to congressional elections? And if it is a problem, is there anything that could be done about it? Well, I think ever since Roosevelt, the focus has been on the executive and uh, more so than ever before because of the power of the executive, the growth of the, of the, of the government establishment and the, the way that people's minds work. You, fo you said the word focus, that's the word. You can focus on one president. You can't focus on a potpourri of 430, 500, 535 people. You can't think like that. There, there isn't, first of all, party discipline like there used to be. If you had a British-style party discipline like in Labor Party politics or Tory party politics, you can actually look at the leaders on either side and say, that's how, I'll focus on Major today. I know what, uh, Cameron, what he's up to. He's fascinating. But as long as you have a lack of discipline in the parties, I don't think people are going to be able to focus on the amorphous nature of the U.S. Con I worked for Tip O'Neill for six years every day of my life. We tried to create a counter pulpit to the presidency. And so I made sure as much as I could that the speaker was talked to and about as much as the president. I think we succeed as well as anybody at that. But it's a real challenge because in that case, we had a partisan difference between the president. This time around, uh, you've got Nancy Pelosi who's doing a pretty good job and you've got, and I think more than that, in fact, and Harry Reid, not perhaps as dramatic as she is, but uh, it's just very hard in our media-driven society to focus on an amorphous body of 535 people. It just doesn't, our focus doesn't work. That was your word that works. It's easier to focus on electing a president. It's the most personal office in the country. Everyone focuses on who they, write, who they vote for for president. They feel a personal connection to the guy or the woman. If it's a woman soon, I don't like him. I don't like her. I like her. I don't like him. You know, he drives me crazy. I mean, everybody has a certain take on the guy, and they also have an emotion towards him. I mean, there's not a person in this room that doesn't have an emotional take one way or another on President Bush, a real feeling about the guy. And you probably have already established one about the three candidates for president now already before they get elected. This is, it's very hard to get a feeling about a senator who's your senator. And unless you're from probably a, a western or southern state, the governor, because governors in the east aren't that big a deal. Governors are bigger out in the west, and you know, Utah governor is a big deal, I think. You know, it's a strange time thing. For one more question, and we're going to go here because this young lady came waiting. Um, are we done already? Hi, I'm from Philadelphia. My name's Marion, and um, where are you from, Laura Marion? No, I'm from Center City. I went to Masterman. Oh, really? Where do you live? <laughs> <laughs> Um, <clears throat> what war? I was actually, um, I'm act, uh, <laughs> I'm the Taz ward. I, you live I'm near not, Washington Square, uh, Rittenhouse yeah, Square? Yeah, Washington Square. Around that area. Okay. Um, <laughs> now you know where I live. Um, so, 
I, I was actually going to ask a question that the gentleman before me asked, but um, I guess my question is, um, what advice would you give to our generation to be more politically active since Tom Freeman of the Washington um, New York Times calls us the quiet generation? Well, I don't, I don't agree with him. And um, what else don't I agree with him about? Um, <laughs> I was going to write a chapter in my book called uh, I Disagree with Tom Friedman Despite His Millions of Sales because uh, the world is, isn't flat. It's round. What goes around comes around. It is cyclical. And uh, life is very cyclical. Uh, I, I, don't, I think your generation has a lot to teach mine. Like mine had a lot to teach my dad's. And all this talk about the great generation, the greatest generation, is a mixed bag. Although they were non-complainers, those who grew up in the Great Depression and fought in World War II, they, they were enormously good at not complaining about their fate. They get stuck in the wrong duty in the war. They get beat up in life. They, don't make, they, didn't, they didn't complain. They are great. My dad never complained. His brother was a tank commander, went into uh, one of the concentration camps, never complained about life. They just took it. Uh, my other uncle was in... Uh, South Pacific and Australia, they married an Australian. They had a very heroic life and they didn't complain about it. It was tough. So that's the good part. They also didn't protest, which is the bad part. They accepted the way things were. They got in line, they danced the dance steps, everybody danced, they dressed the clothes everybody wore, they got their hair cut every week and a half for two weeks, they did everything right. They accepted things. My generation knew how to cause trouble. I'm very proud of the fact that we still have the music on my serious radio station. The music's still there. Uh, I still love it. We still got Dennis Hopper and Jagger. And we got some icons from my generation because we caused trouble. We protested what everybody else had always accepted. And when you went to school in my day, it was exciting just to walk on campus. And if you were on campus in the 60s, it was chillingly exciting because there was in the air a, a, a Something that grabbed an electricity that grabbed you just being on campus because campus was where to be, whether it was Madison or you know, or Berkeley or uh, what's that place in uh, Michigan? <laughs> it was it, and here, of course, was the place to be because it was where the war was being fought at home by the only people fighting the war at home, the students, because they were on the firing line. The students stood up against the war. There were wonderful stories about it. I mean, there was the guy that said to the draft, they came to take it for the draft, and he just put a label on him that said, take me. And at the end, he put a label on himself, put me back where you found me, at the end of his tour. We love those stories. You go to meetings, and I wore meetings in the 60s, and somebody would always say, no cameras. <laughs> Everybody thought J. Edgar Hoover was coming in the window. <laughs> it was great. It was exciting. And I remember being at Chapel Hill in grad school after going to Holy Cross, and I remember the excitement of just walking across Franklin Street in this beautiful little college town and hearing I am a walrus, ooh, ooh, kachu, playing over and over again for the Beatles. The music, the movies, uh, The Graduate, Bonnie and Clyde, everything was wrapped into revolution. It was exciting stuff. So uh, you don't have that, but you do have this election. <laughs> uh, and this election is so much better because you kids and I sound like, you know, Uncle Tanus here, but uh, you kids get up in the morning and your parents say go to church or go to synagogue or study or something. This is the first time in history your kids have said to their parents, get off your duff and vote for Barack. Kids are telling their parents what to do. We don't have this ethnic problem you guys have. You know, my kids come home with dates. They're interracial dating. Never even mention it. They have teachers that are African-American. Never mention it. Don't think it's important. To them, it's an accidental fact. It's not essential at all to notice. Do you understand that, how different that is? I went to school for 12 years, never had an African-American in my class. Today, nobody even mentions that there is one. It's not important. And so they date and don't even bring it up. So it's a different time to live. And if this election turns out a little different than the ones in the past, it's because times have changed and your generation has been different than mine and better. So this idea of superior generations, I don't buy, because I think each generation offers something different. And it may lack some things because it's had too much given to it. But it also brings something. And I think today's generation, and I'm not just pandering, I don't like to pander, as you noticed. Um, I, uh, I really think I salute you for, for kicking us all in the ass, which is a good thing to do at times. 
a little revolution now and then. But please keep it up. Don't quit in November. Vote. You know, keep kicking. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and thank you all for coming.